Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome back. Just uh, getting things set up, but in about whatever, five minutes, we'll get things rolling. Hope you guys are doing well. Had a great weekend. And um, having a good day so far. <clears throat> Good morning, Jason. Hi. Good to see you. Hey, Leo. Good to see you here. Hey, Brandon, Mia, Sebastian, yes, good to see you again. Hey, Al, it's good to see you. Good morning. <clears throat> Hi there, Katan. Did you get added and everything's all good now? Because I don't think I was sent another request, but I thought that I might have had to give one. I anyway, it seems that you're enrolled at this point. Um, but I'll go back and double check the roster. We'll get in touch. Anyways, good to see you. And hi, everyone else. Brittany, Danielle, Denise. Appreciate you guys being up. <clears throat> Got about three minutes, so no rush. Good morning, Devin. <clears throat> Okay, awesome, cool. Hey Kevin, hi Angel, William. <clears throat> Morning Stephanie. Okay, a couple minutes. Morning, Jocelyn. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Hey Angel, good to see you. Morning. Hey Mark. <clears throat> hey, hope your Tuesday's going well, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Just another minute, just hanging in there until we get to the official class time and then we'll, um, we'll get started. Allison, am I gonna watch the Super Bowl on Sunday? Yeah, I'm gonna watch. I haven't been following too closely the teams. They're not like either really uh, major teams to me, but I, I find it interesting how Tom Brady is competing in his 10th Super Bowl I've never been a huge fan of the Patriots and stuff, but uh, at this point, it's impossible not to give respect to him just for his consistency and durability over his career. So I'll be watching with some interest, 
But yeah, <clears throat> Super Bowl Sunday coming up. Okay, guys, well, it's pretty much 10 a.m. now, so I'm going to go ahead and let us get started. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for being here. I hope you had a pretty good weekend. Um, basically, we're just continuing through our series of lectures in the same order that you see from our calendar. Um, good morning to one and all that are here. I guess to just kick off the meeting, I'll um, ask if you haven't already said hello or something in the chat, go ahead and just post a comment um, so that I know that you're present. And um, if I ever needed to verify attendance or check on it, I would have a record of being here from your comment. If you are using a username that's different from your uh, name on the roster, then maybe just mention um, what that is so that I don't fail to um, have the records. But basically, we're good to go. So thanks again, everyone, for being here today. And, um, and I hope your classes are going well so far. So let, let's get back into our material here. As you all know, the first topic of the semester is uh, philosophy of religion. This is um, what we started on last Thursday. Philosophy of religion considers questions about the existence of God. What are the arguments that can be um, stated in favor of the existence of God? What are some of the major criticisms of those different arguments? And so we're basically taking a tour through some of the greatest hits of, you know, arguments for theism um, in the whole Western written tradition. Um, now, one argument that has been talked about by a lot of people since it was first developed back in 1077 is uh, the ontological argument. So we're still today kind of uh, studying the ontological argument because we're going to take a look at all these criticisms of it. Last week on Thursday, the main goal was to just try and get clear on what the argument itself says. Today we're going to um, move beyond that to try and explain what are different criticisms and objections to that same argument. But the topic of discussion for the time being is still the ontological argument. <clears throat> now you guys may remember that this is first formulated by the um, classical philosopher and theologian St. Anselm, who lived from 1033 to 1109. And he wrote this book, The Proslogion, in 1077, which has this argument up here in it. So um, we spent a good deal of time just trying to go over the argument. And I thought what I would want to start off here with is just if anybody could try to offer me a brief summary statement of their own of what you think, how the argument tries to make its case for God existing. Um, so I'll just see what you can say, and then I'll try to clarify and um, expand on it if I need to. But I kind of want to see where your head is at, where your current understanding is. So, um, you know, like one of your old friends that's never studied philosophy says, what are you doing in that class? You're like, okay, I'm doing the ontological, we're studying what's called the ontological argument. And they say to you, what? What is that? Okay, so how would you break it down to like a peer or somebody or anybody, right? Just giving a simple, straightforward basic, like what's the gist of the argument? How does this man try to prove that there's God? <clears throat> Put yourself in the position of having to explain it, since that's, you know, what the whole goal of the class is, that you can give these clear explanations of the arguments. So what's up? How is it that uh, St. Anselm tries to prove the case that God exists? Walk me through it if you can, even just talk about some of the steps. Where does he begin his argument? How does he lead us to his conclusion? Using your memory, your notes, or some combination of both, let's see what you can place here in the chat. And it's good to see everybody. I see all you guys, good people with a good morning. I hope you're having a good morning, too. But let's get my question out there on the table, and then we'll move from there. That'll be our jumping off point. So what do you say is the basic idea of the ontological argument? And I'll make sure to explain as necessary anything that's not clear. But I want to hear your idea about it first. So the guy's trying to say God exists, but how does he get to that conclusion? <clears throat> okay, so Janice, let me look at some different examples of student responses. I'll start with yours. St. Anselm argues that God is the greatest conceivable being. Yes, he does. And so because of this, there is not any way that he cannot exist. Very good. That's, that's basically the core of the argument. We can add a few more details. Let's see what some others have said here. Brandon, if there is an agreed-upon definition that God is all-powerful and nothing is more great than God, 
that denying his existence is paradoxical because that would imply something is more great. Uh, that's very, very sharp, and I like the way you uh, stated it there. Yes, he does begin by mentioning that the definition of God, and Mark, you mentioned this as well, is defined as the best thing ever to exist. Well, I don't know if I would put it as to exist, because that would assume the existence before he tries to prove it in a few steps that follow after that. He just begins by saying the idea of God, the idea, whether the thing's real or not, is the idea of being. And since existing in the mind and in reality is greater than just your mind, then absolutely, Mark, he would have to exist in both. And you add to that, good. In addition, one cannot even truly uh, think that God does not exist because that would also make him less perfect. Very good. Okay, so let me kind of bring together a couple of the student comments here and make sure we're clear. Anselm tries to prove that God exists starting off with the definition of God. He says, what is God believed to be? God is believed to be the greatest conceivable being, or sometimes as he words it, the being than which none greater can be conceived. In other words, the greatest being that you could possibly ever contemplate or think of or even imagine. Nothing greater than God could ever be thought of. He's the greatest thing you could think of. Okay, so then he says, well, is this being the greatest conceivable being real? Or is it just something that's like a made up idea in your head? Which one? Is he only in the mind or is he in the mind and in reality? Okay, so then we had brief discussion of how some things do only exist in the mind, like fairies and leprechauns and I don't know, um, you know, like characters from film Spider-Man, you know, they're not real people. Um, but on the other hand, there are things that exist in both, obviously. Me, my cat right here, she exists in always thinking of her in my mind, but she's also real, flesh and blood kitty right here. So there's things that exist in the mind and in reality. And the point that Anselm is insisting on is that it's greater to be in both. It's greater for something to not just be only in the mind, but on top of that to be in reality also. So now if we focus on the definition that we began with, greatest conceivable being, he thinks that this implies, this logically implies that uh, since that's how God is defined, he must exist in both because it would be less great if he weren't. And that would be like saying the greatest conceivable being is less great than something else you could think of. And that is a contradiction. So he makes the case based on the definition greatest conceivable and the associated point that it's greater for something to exist in the mind and in reality than just the mind. And okay, good, Mark. I'm glad that you point out the second part. He also mentions afterward that God cannot even be thought to not exist because for something to be able to be thought not to exist is less great than a thing that can't be thought of as non-existent. So since God is defined as the greatest of all, he couldn't possibly uh, possess the, the limitation or defect of being capable of being thought not to exist. So two things he thinks he's proven. God must exist in the mind and in reality due to the definition. And also he can't even be thought not to. So I have just one more quick question before I can move on to the uh, objections against Anselm. And here's my last question for the class. Anybody can answer this. What does he say then is the thought in the mind of an atheist or whoever who says, at least they think they say, there is no God? Because, right, he says it's not possible to even think this. So how does he answer the question, well, what is in the mind of someone who says, I don't think there's a God? What does he have to say in order to reconcile that idea with his claim that it's not possible to think so? not possible to think that God does not exist. Well, it appears that we have people who are atheists. So what does he say of them? Do they not believe that God exists? Do they think there's no God? What's the answer? <clears throat> because as we've pointed out, he is claiming that it's not possible to think God doesn't exist. So Brandon, you say, he believes that they don't understand the definition. And I noticed that you really paid great attention to some of my comments at the end, which I just kind of offered. I find it a little bit paradoxical, a little contradictory for him to say on the one hand, we all have the same idea of God, but then at the tail end to say, well, atheists, they might not really understand it because they're they are thinking of the thought that God does not exist, but that thought can't be had, so it must be of a different being. Yes, and so, Leo, yes, right. They're not thinking of God. They may mouth the words God. It may sound like that. They may think of that word in their head, but attached to their understanding of it is not the real idea. 
And that's why he says, technically, that doesn't count as a thought that God doesn't exist. That's a thought that God, in quotes, referring to something different, uh, does not exist. Okay, very good. So I'm glad that we could uh, clarify and just review that. Now, having a very detailed and clear comprehension of the argument, we're going to move to the objections. Okay, so I think I might have told you before, and it's true. In philosophy, we are always presented with a variety of arguments on all different sides of any topic. So it's not as if people just argue that it exists and their arguments go unchallenged and that's just the end of it. No, there are going to be opponents of that argument who try to state their reasons for criticism, objection, and so forth. Um, so in the same way within law, you don't just have the, def the prosecutor go up and say, here's the reasons why this person is guilty. And then there's no defense attorney and that's just the end of it. No, there's going to be a balanced presentation of arguments on either side. And in the same way in philosophy, we do the same. So um, you've now heard the ontological argument. I think you understand the basic gist of it. It's based on a definition of God and tracing that definition through to the conclusion that he must be real because that's part of what it is to be that great. But now we have to focus on what are objections to this argument. So for anybody here who felt like um, I don't know, the ontological argument, I'm suspicious of it, or I don't feel that it's a great argument, um, then maybe you'll appreciate this meeting today because we will hear all of these sort of scholarly objections, some of them anyway, that have been given as to why there's problems perhaps with this argument, okay? So just know that that's going to be a constant theme throughout the semester, hearing one argument and then hearing uh, the other side present their rebuttal. And that's a great intellectual skill. You want to be able to know how people think on all sides of an issue. Kind of analyze everybody's position and come to your own conclusions. So let's now speak about objections to the ontological argument. <clears throat> I just added over here on the top left, objections to. So I didn't change the heading that much. Um, let me see here, a question from Brandon. Um, <clears throat> how were philosophers not persecuted during these times for trying to deny the existence of God? Well, uh, PhD. Um, so Anselm believes in God, and he's defending the existence of God with arguments. So he's not at all considered uh, unorthodox or heretical to the church. Um, many of the people who state objections uh, don't themselves disagree that God exists, at least in the earlier time periods of Western history. So you are correct that in like the medieval period and even all the way up through uh, the late Renaissance, there would have been consequences for a person coming out and just saying there's no God or whatever. Um, but oftentimes the academic objections that were presented teach me, were just presented as reasons that the argument fails, not reasons that the um, God doesn't exist. Sorry, about it. I'm distracted by my cat. Let me just move her out for a minute. She sometimes bites on these buttons and stuff and a little Lacoste alligator. So, who's she? <laughs> okay. Good. So, um, Brandon, your intuition is generally correct. Like, uh, I thought I could put her in the other room, but I have to seal her off a little bit better. So. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, so what your intuition is is that it would have been um, difficult or impossible to present arguments that God doesn't exist in these earlier historical time periods when the church was like this dominant institution and we didn't have the separation of church and state. Yes, people could be persecuted for that. Many times the objections were stated academically as just like um, arguments and why the arguments either succeed or fail but still with the general agreement that God does exist. In fact, um, it's a good question because it relates to the next author. So let me go into this. One critic of the ontological argument that we're now going to study is this man named Gaunilo. So Gaunilo was a um, Benedictine monk. So he's a monk in the Christian church. Therefore, he's definitely a believer in God. If you're a monk, 
you're not even just an ordinary believer. You're very devout. You've devoted your whole life to living in a monastery. And so um, he was a devout Christian. He believed in God. Not a lot is known about his life because only a couple of writings have survived through to the current day. Um, but in around the year 1078, which is about a year after the Proslogion was published, he wrote this criticism of the ontological argument. And so now already you can understand that in this case, we have a man who believes in God, who does not disagree with the claim that God exists. But what he finds fault with is the argument given by Anselm that attempts to prove it in that way. According to Gaunilo, uh, the real good reasons to believe in God don't have anything to do with the stated ontological argument. So he finds fault with the argument, but not necessarily with its overall conclusion. I guess you could describe him as a person who doesn't think this is the right way to try and make the case for God's existence even if he doesn't perhaps disagree in general. So um, his textbook is called In Behalf of the Fool. In Behalf of the Fool, now it's kind of like a clever title. Because if you remember, um, Anselm was quoting the Psalms when he wrote his argument in the Proslogion. And he says at one point, he quotes the Psalms, the scripture where it says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Um, and from that point onward in his essay, he kind of refers to those that don't believe in God as the fool. So here's Gamilo kind of taking up the title of fool and just embracing it and say, Okay, well, here's what I could say on the behalf of the so-called fool or literally the non-believer um, or those who are not convinced by the ontological argument. So he's going to take up the defense of the other side because he doesn't like the ontological argument. So the first thing he says in uh, making his criticism, his objection, is that he just defines the argument itself. He just kind of summarizes what it is. So let me read that part, which is on page 17. To begin, he again, he's just kind of restating his um, his opponent's argument, and he says here, to one doubting whether or denying that there is something of such a nature than which nothing greater can be thought, it is said in the proslogion that its existence is proved. First, because the very one who denies or doubts it already has it in his mind, since when he hears it spoken of, he understands what is said. And further, because what he understands is necessarily such that it exists not only in the mind, but also in reality. And this is proved by the fact that it is greater to exist both in the mind and in reality than in the mind alone. Because if this same being exists in the mind alone, anything that existed also in reality would be greater than this being. And thus, that which is greater than everything would be less than something and would not be greater than everything, which is obviously a contradiction. Therefore, it is necessarily the case that that which is greater than everything, being already proven to exist in the mind, should exist not only in the mind, but also in reality, because otherwise it would not be greater than everything. Okay, so that is like his, um, you know, clear and succinct restatement and summary of the original argument. But he's just doing that to present to the reader what it is that he is now going to criticize. So having now pro provided the statement of the argument, he goes on to criticize. Gamilo's criticism of the argument relies heavily on a analogy. And it relies on an analogy to a hypothetical type of scenario. So just know this, that oftentimes in philosophy, authors will present fanciful and sometimes far-fetched hypothetical scenarios, but they're doing this merely to try and advance a point within an argument. So uh, get used to that, basically, is what I'm saying. Of listening to weird hypotheticals as you entertain philosophical arguments is a pretty much constant that runs through a lot of philosophical writing all the way back to the ancient days all the way to the current day. So this is a common feature of logical argument in philosophy to present a hypothetical. So Gamilo says, imagine this if you can, all right? I want you to imagine an idea that we will call the lost island, okay? The lost island. And this lost island, he says, sorry, island. He says, this lost island, um, let you think about it and understand it in your mind as a great island, but not just any great island. We're saying that this is literally the greatest conceivable island, okay? So that's our idea here, the greatest conceivable island. 
Okay, so greatest conceivable island. Um, so whatever makes an island a good island, whatever makes an island great, so to speak, let's suppose that this island has it to the maximum infinite degree. So um, it's got the best weather, the best uh, beaches, the best water, the best um, amenities and uh, in entertainment. So if you wanted an island to be great, you couldn't do better than this because it's the greatest island that you could ever conceive of, right? And we just call it by a label, the lost island. Now, if the wheels in your mind are turning already and you're trying to connect this to the ontological argument, that's good. You might notice, what is Gamilo doing here? He's constructing an example, which is supposed to be somewhat of a parallel to the definition of, given of God by Anselm. So God is defined as greatest conceivable being. Gaunilo says, okay, well, let's play with that same kind of idea. Imagine, if you will, a greatest conceivable island. Call it the lost island. What he's going to say next is this. If we imagine uh, that Anselm's logic is correct in proving the existence of God, then what do you think we would have to then also say about our hypothetical island? Tell me that. What do you think is his overall point? That if, if Anselm's uh, reasoning is correct when it comes to the definition of God and his, uh, therefore, it must exist, then in the case of our so-called lost island, we would have to assume or infer what about it? If Anselm's correct, then basically, what has to be true of this um, island that we're talking about? See if anyone can come, come through with that, um, that conclusion that I'm trying to, uh, to get you to understand. Yeah, name it. That the island must exist. Correct. Why? Who could tell me that? Why does he say that this lost island is defined as the greatest conceivable island, that it must actually really exist, at least according to Anselm? It has to exist in reality, not just the mind, right? Because it's greater to exist in both the mind and in reality, as Anselm argues, than to just exist in the mind. So, Brandon, is he trying to say it's great, but you don't know it's great if you don't know about its existence? No, not quite, Brandon. Um, what he's saying is this, just the idea of a perfect island doesn't prove that it's real. And in fact, there is no such thing as the lost island. So he thinks that's a proof of the point that just having a thought in your head of the greatest conceivable whatever cannot by itself prove the real fact that the thing exists in reality. Okay, so he says, if you're doubtful of the existence of this island that I just made up out of nowhere, then you should have no confidence in the way that Anselm is arguing for God. You can't build a bridge from an idea of something greatest or perfect to the conclusion that it definitely exists in reality. Or if you could do that, then I guess we would have to assume this island exists. But that's clearly absurd. And therefore, the two arguments kind of have the same equal status. If you reject the case of an island, then you should not be any more uh, confident that you could prove the existence of God in the same way. Okay? So... Um, let me read a bit from his words, and you can see how he puts it, and maybe that will add some more clarity. So he says here, um, I'm just reading through it. He says, the fool, the atheist, can perhaps reply that this thing is said already to exist in the mind only in the sense that I understand what is said. Because couldn't I say that all kinds of unreal things not existing in themselves in any way at all are equally in the mind? Since if anyone speaks about them, I understand what they say. For example... They say that there is in the ocean somewhere an island, which because of the difficulty of finding that which does not exist, they have called the lost island. And the story goes that it is blessed with all manner of priceless riches and delights in abundance, much more even than the happy isles. And having no owner or inhabitant, it is superior everywhere to all those other lands that men inhabit. Okay, greatest conceivable island. So if anyone tells me that it is like this, I shall understand easily what is said since nothing is difficult about that, so you'll have an idea in the mind. But if you should then go on to say, as though it was a logical result of this, you cannot any more doubt that this island that is more excellent than all other lands truly exists somewhere in reality than you can doubt that it is in your mind. And since it is more excellent to exist, not only in the mind alone, but also in reality, therefore it must be that it exists. For if it did not exist, any other land existing in reality would be better than it, and so this island 
already claimed to be more excellent than all others would not be more excellent. So he says that's the form of reasoning that would establish the so-called existence of the lost island based merely on the definition or idea of it as the greatest conceivable island. But now he comes back and says this. If someone wishes thus to persuade me that the island really exists beyond all doubt, I should either think that he was joking or I would find it hard to decide which of us is the bigger fool, me, if I agree with him, or he, if he thinks that he's proving the existence of the island with any certainty. So there you have it. He says, the reasoning of Anselm is in fact quite weak, and that can be exposed, he thinks, by utilizing the same format of argument and directing it towards something that we obviously know does not exist, like a perfect island. So basically, he creates kind of like a, uh, a parody of Anselm's original argument to show that it, if we took it seriously, it would purport to prove things that are uh, evidently not real. So like I could say to you right now, imagine in your mind the concept of like the greatest conceivable piece of music, like a piece of music so great that it's the greatest you could ever think of. So have I just now proven, boom, that that must actually really exist just because it's better for it to be real than just to be a thought? Obviously, this abstract idea of like the ideal musical composition is just an idea and not something real. Or I could say to you, imagine the perfect burger. You know, you like to eat food, you're a foodie. Imagine the burger than which none greater can be conceived, the greatest conceivable hamburger, perfect in every way, none, none could ever surpass. So since I've defined the idea does this mean that it actually establishes that there is such a thing in reality? Again, no. So he uses the case of the greatest conceivable island, but we could substitute for that the greatest conceivable X for any X, and we would see the same point over and over again, that it's ridiculous to think that we can prove something exists in reality just by starting off sitting in a chair and thinking about the idea of a perfect example of that kind of thing. Do you see what I am saying? So. He finds fault with the ontological argument on the basis that it tries to prove a being exists just because we have an idea of it as a perfect being. Um, he thinks that's not an effective way to make the case that something exists. If it were, then we would be roped into assuming the existence of this island, but that's clearly false. So what has to be rejected is instead the argument form, which attempts to establish these false conclusions. I think I mentioned something briefly about the reductio ad absurdum argument strategy last time, and that is when you want to prove something. So in order to do that, you for a moment assume the opposite of what you seek to prove, and then show that that leads to something absurd or impossible. Anselm did this himself because he said, God, he's not only in the mind, he's in reality too. He's not just in the mind, but assume that he was just in the mind. That's him assuming the opposite of his conclusion. Assuming God only exists in the mind, he's not perfectly great, but that contradicts the definition, so that can't be true. Therefore, he exists not merely in the mind, but also in reality. Now, Gaunilo is kind of using his own little reductio against Anselm. He says, well, Anselm's argument does not prove that God exists, but let's suppose that it does. Like, let's just grant that it proves God's existence. If so, then the same type of argument style could prove the existence of this ridiculous lost island, but we know that that's absurd. So his argument strategy, therefore, must not be um, effective and correct, all right? So that's one look at a possible objection to Anselm. Um, if I want to kind of say it very blunt and, like, just plain spoken, you know, Anselm's trying to prove that God exists because he thinks we all have this idea of him as the greatest being, and part of that greatness has to be being in reality, not just in your head. Gamilo is saying, well... I could make up the idea of anything that I call greatest conceivable whatever. Let's, let's go with the case of an island. Are you telling me that this island is real just because I've defined it as the greatest thing in my mind? That does, that's clearly implausible. So I find your way of arguing to be itself defective and, uh, and incorrect. So that's the case here. We've seen now a study in one argument and one objection. But it's not the only objection, the one that Gamilo gave. So if that makes some good enough sense, I'm going to move to the next author in the series here. And we're going to start talking about the objections of a more contemporary uh, philosopher from the 20th century. And this is Mr. G.E. Moore. Okay, so new objection lined up right now. This is still the same topic, objections to the ontological argument. But we're going to learn a total of three of those. And for now, we just have one, one from Gaunilo. Okay, so 
Everybody's still with me. If, if everything's all good, just let me know in the chat. Your uh, the audio and video feed is coming through, and um, your notes are all good, and you can com comprehend me. If, if there's ever anything you'd like me to kind of repeat, um, revisit, or explain again, I'm always happy to do that. But just know that um, I'm paying attention to your guys' comments. Okay, thanks, Leo. Okay, so then here's another um, author. This is the author G.E. Moore. Now, this takes us much further ahead in history um, because, right, Anselm and Gamilo were debating this back in the year 1077. And um, G.E. Moore, he lives much closer to our current day. So he's a British philosopher who lived from 1873 to 1958. And um, <clears throat> in 1935, he wrote a, um, a paper, and he was also – he presented it at a conference in um, – where was it? Da, 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 da. At the Aristotelian Society in, in Britain. Anyway, um, he presents this paper in 1935. Uh, no, 1936. And the title is this. The title is, Is Existence a Predicate? Is existence a predicate? So his goal is, again, it's to defeat the ontological argument, to debunk the argument, to rebut it, um, to object to it, however you want to put it. But um, his title gives us an insight into how he's going to try and make his objection. So his, his uh, paper is a question. Is existence a predicate? That's the question. So we must now understand and come to learn what it means for – what is a predicate? What's the definition of this word predicate? So let me explain. So a predicate is just kind of a fancy piece of jargon that is used in logic and sometimes in studies of grammar. And what it refers to is um, an attribute or a feature of something. That's like a quality that something has. So I'll put it that way. An attribute or a feature of something. Um, <clears throat> so they say in grammar that every complete sentence uh, contains a subject and a predicate. The subject of the sentence is the thing that's being mentioned primarily, and then the predicate in the same sentence is whatever uh, attribute that is attributed of that subject. So let me just um, test your understanding of that with an easy example. Say that I tell you that the dog is brown. Okay, now what would you judge or guess to be the subject of that statement, that the dog is brown? What could be the subject there? Dog is brown. That's the sentence. Subject of the sentence is probably what? Okay, good. I'm seeing some responses. It's uh, the dog, right. The dog is the subject of that sentence. Now, um, if I say that the dog is brown, and I do, then what's the predicate of the same sentence? The subject is dog. The predicate is what thing? What feature, attribute, quality? This is a pretty easy softball for you. It's being brown. Yes, it's the feature, the attribute of being brown. Okay, so um, every complete sentence combines a subject and predicate of some form. If I tell you that I'm, I'm hungry, then I am the subject of the sentence, and hunger is the attribute that I'm associating with me, the subject. If I say um, life is hard, then life is the subject of the sentence, and being hard or difficult is the predicate attributed of that uh, subject there. Okay, so anyway, now we have a better understanding of what is a predicate. It's a feature, it's a quality of a thing, and we can describe almost anything as according to its attributes. You know, some things are uh, tall, short, heavy, light, um, some things are happy, sad, um, white, black, brown, you know, whatever. So attributes of things. Um, now his title then is this question. Is existence, is, is the topic of or concept of existence a predicate or no? Is it, in other words, an attribute or a feature of something, this idea of existence? And here's a little spoiler alert as to how he's going to ultimately answer that. He, the answer is no, he says. It's not a predicate. 
And um, that's where he really finds fault with the ontological argument. That's where his main point of attack is. Because, sorry, one second. Let me, Peachy's crying. I got to help her one second. She just hates being locked away in the other room, so I can't stand to hear her crying over there. If she comes and pops up, I'm just going to put her down for a few times, and I'm sure she'll get the message. Um, but anyway, back to the lecture. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> no, she's here. She's all good. Um, he's saying that existence is not a predicate, and he thinks that that's really where the ontological argument goes astray, because according to the argument, Existence is a feature because if God is perfect, he has to have that feature, including all the other great features that God has, being all-knowing, all-powerful. And on top of that, if he, he has to exist because any being that lacks this attribute is less perfect than some being that does have the attribute. Um, but, you know, Moore says that's all completely incorrect. It's not accurate to say that existence is an attribute of something. And once you see that, you realize that it won't serve the purposes of Anselm's argument the way that he hopes. Because, again, I'll repeat, Anselm says that God's defined as the greatest conceivable being. Well, built into that greatness is having all the best features that you could imagine. And existence, he says, is one of them. You can't lack for that. If you lack existence, then you're just not perfectly great. Now here comes G.E. Moore entering the scene like a thousand years later. And he says, hold on a minute. Who says existence is an attribute? That's not correct. Existence, when you think about it, when you analyze it, it's not really a feature of a thing. And knowing that means that even if you thought something was defined as the greatest conceivable being, it would make no sense to say, oh, so it must have that feature. Because it's wrong on its face to say that existence is a feature of anything or an attribute. Now, um, the way that he makes this point that existence is not an actual attribute is a little uh, technical and it involves some linguistic comparisons of two groups of sentences. So I'm going to get into his example, of course, because I need you to understand that. But before that, I just want to kind of speak from a level of everyday common sense. When you describe things, that's when you talk about what features a thing has. And we do that all the time, sometimes without realizing that we do it. Like, say that you're going to sell something. You know, you have a, I don't know, a house or a car that you want to put up on the market. Let's say it's a car that you want to sell, right? You can't just tell people in the advertisement for the car, car for sale, 10000 bucks. You'd want to at least report to the market what some of the attributes of the car are. You'd say things like, okay, it's make and model, mileage, you know, how many doors it has, whatever amenities, you know, features, if it has a sunroof, if it's a uh, four-cylinder, six-cylinder, you know, stuff like that, the paint, color, whatever. You'd talk about all those things in listing the price so people know what it is they might be buying. But here would be a very awkward and just not really normal kind of ad. You look at the car ad, it says $10,000 or best offer, here's what the car is like. 1995 Ford Bronco, um, white, about 40,000 miles on it, has a sunroof, it exists, it's got an all-wheel drive, um, it's got a, like a bumper kit that's kind of like got some chrome, but wait, hold on. One of those things was not like the others, right? One of those things should stick out to you as weird to mention. And of course, I hope you could see that it's mentioning that the car exists. I mean, it's a given if you're going to be trying to sell something that the thing exists. You don't describe a thing's features by listing existence as one of them. Sometimes you describe yourselves, right? We do class introductions. Professor calls on you and you say, here's me. You know, uh, I'm a big time avid athlete. Um, I'm studying business. I have a dream to one day start my own business. I grew up in Florida, you know, whatever. A person's telling you about themselves. And then say, I exist, which is one of my cool features. Um, you know, I'm, I've learned how to play the flute at a young age. But hold on. Mentioning that you exist is not really talking about what you're like or describing you. So I hope that off just a level of common sense, it should come somewhat um, intuitive to you that existence is not like a, an attribute or a feature. I'd rather think of it as like a precondition for even having attributes because something that doesn't exist is not something that's lacking a feature. It's just nothing at all, you know. Um, but... As much as it might make ordinary sense to say this and give you these examples, uh, for better or worse, I do have to talk to you about his actual uh, illustration of the same point, which is a bit more complex, but we'll get to the to understanding. Okay, so um, <clears throat> clearing this space on the board. Here's how he makes that point, or he, he tries to make the point, that existence is not actually 
a predicate, in other words, attribute. So he says, let us see this by means of comparing two sets of sentences, uh, one of them where the predicate is given, and in the other set of sentences, we will replace that predicate with the verb exist. And he says that when we substitute the predicate for the word exists, you'll notice that the statements no longer make coherent sense. And that's where he thinks it can be shown vividly through language that existence is actually not a predicate. Janice, you say, saying something exists in a sentence makes me question whether it does or not. Uh, sure, I mean, we should question everything, right? But some things definitely exist, like you and me. And so um, I guess some things are uh, harder to know whether they exist, but I'm trying to give you easy examples when I give these, like the case of a car or whatever. Um, if I say my car exists, I guess in ordinary conversation, it's so odd to mention that, that you might already start to doubt whether I'm trying to deceive you or whatever. Um, like if a person said, you know, um, like I've never been to Canada, like out of nowhere, they just tell you that. You might be like, why are you mentioning that? I didn't even ask you that. Maybe you have been there and you're trying to now just cover it up. But anyway, that's a little bit of a sidebar. Like um, one way or the other, what we're really focused on here is just whether existence is a feature of something. And I think you get the sense that it doesn't make uh, proper sense to say it as a predicate in a description of anything. But now, how does the author make that point? Okay, so the author says, we'll see existence is not a predicate when we just compare some sentences that have a predicate in them with another group of sentences which swaps the predicate out for the word exists. And the chosen example that he gives, for whatever reason, is these statements about tigers growling, tigers growl. So imagine the statement here, tiger's growl. That single sentence, he says, um, can be interpreted in three possible ways. And so in these three possible variations on the statement, we will add a prefix, either all, most, or some. So now look at these three, <clears throat> all tiger's growl. Most tiger's growl. And then finally, just some tigers growl. <clears throat> okay, so now, we see these three statements, all, most, and some tigers growl. And um, the point to consider is that even though each of those say slightly different things about the quantity or ratio of tigers that growl or don't. Even though they say slightly different things, each one of them makes clear sense. Nobody gets confused or thrown off when they see one of those sentences. Like, it doesn't provoke a response of, huh, I don't understand, what are you even saying? All of them make decent sense. Like, so let's go through each one. Let's talk about what would have to be true for each one to, to be a true statement. So the first one on top says, all tigers growl. If that were so, what does that mean? That means that there is not even one tiger. There's no tiger that doesn't growl. So each and every one, 100% of them growl. That's what this would have to involve if it was true. So out of the tigers, every single one growls, and there's not any of them that don't. How about most tigers growl? What would have to be true for that to bear truth? It wouldn't require that all of them do. So it's different from the top. What would have to be true in order for most tigers growl to be a fact? It would mean that how many of them do? Let's see if you can give me that. If most tigers growl, then what are we saying? In other words, how many? A majority, good, a majority growl. If most tigers growl, then it can't be that it's the minority. It would have to be at least one more than half, okay? So take the set of tigers, however many there are, and the greater quantity of them growl, and a lesser number of them do not. Okay, now how about the third one? Some tigers growl. Uh, that doesn't even imply that it's most. For some tigers growl, we just need at a minimum what? For that to be true. So it doesn't mean all of them do. It doesn't mean more than half. But it does have to at least... Uh, imply that what? If some tigers growl, then at least what? 
going into that third and last one there on the board. Yeah, good. That at least one growls, correct. So if there's some tiger that growls, even just one, then this is true. This is only false if no tiger growls at all. It doesn't have to be more than one Alice, but at least minimum one. If it was zero, then that would not be true. In that case, no tiger's growl would be the case. Okay, so what I've just shown you is that with respect to these three statements, although they're saying slightly different things about the number or ratio or quantity of tigers growling versus not, they're all easy to understand and parse. But now what he says is, let us substitute the word growl here with exists, and what that causes is for the statements to no longer make any kind of clear sense. So let's go there. So now what you're looking at is the statements that say all tigers exist, most tigers exist, and some tigers exist. And um, here's his point, that now with this word replacing growls, replacing the predicate, two of these three statements no longer make any kind of uh, reasonable sense at all. For example, let's look at the second one on the board. Most tigers exist. So when we had the statement say most tigers growl, you guys told me correctly that that just would mean that at least the majority of them growl, right? And maybe a smaller number of them don't. But now interpreting this in the same way would mean that what? Most tigers exist, so a majority of them exist, and a minority of them don't exist. But if that confuses you and you don't know how to make sense of that, good, because that's the point, because it doesn't make sense. You cannot divide the number of things that on the one hand exist and on the other hand don't exist, because, right, things that don't exist don't have any number that can be enumerated or quantified. Okay, so like there's 45 of us here um, right now present at the lecture meeting. I could say most of the people that are uh, watching this lecture are not wearing glasses. And that's easy to understand what it means. It means that if you take 45 of the people present, then most of them don't have glasses on like I do, and maybe a minority of them do have the glasses on. But I couldn't say um, most members of the class exist because there's no way to distinguish the case of those that exist from those that don't exist. This don't have numbers. So um, for most tigers exist to have any kind of meaning, we would have to be able to comprehend what it is for there to be a non-existent tiger. And that's just a contradiction in terms. A non-existent thing is nothing. It's not a tiger or anything else. Look around your room right now or wherever you're at. Question, how many non-existent tigers are there? It makes no sense to ask this question. Is it one? Is it a million? Well, it's a nonsense question because things that don't exist can't be numbered. Only things that do exist can be counted up. So when the set of things is a set of existing things, some of them that have a feature and some that don't, like most of us don't have blue eyes or something like that, easy to do the division because we have one category of things that have that feature and another category of things that exist but don't have that feature. But when existence is itself treated as the so-called feature, there's no way to affect a similar um, breakdown of the two categories. So most tigers exist breaks down and makes no logical sense, unlike most tigers growl. And that's the same kind of thing we see with all tigers exist. All tigers growl means that each tiger growls and there's no tiger that doesn't. But modeled along the same interpretation, this would then mean every tiger exists and there is no tiger that does not exist. But yet again, for that to have any kind of coherent sense, we would have to have some kind of comprehension of what it is for something to be a non-existent tiger. And that's just a contradiction in terms yet again. Furthermore, we can see the lack of coherent meaning when existence takes the place of the predicate by considering the negative form of these statements. So say that I told you that some tigers do not growl. Easy to understand, I hope. It just means that there's at least one tiger somewhere that doesn't do that, that doesn't have that attribute. But what is this? Some tigers do not exist. This makes no sense. Some tigers don't exist, so what? They're like um, figments of your imagination, or they're just like in the realm of um, fictional objects. So in the case where we replace ex exists with growls, 
Three of these four statements make no logical sense. This one, he says, is the one and only example of a exists statement that does make some decent sense because some tigers exist only means that there's at least one tiger that's real. It doesn't involve any kind of comparative between the case of the existing and the non-existing. So fair enough, one example makes some kind of sense, but all the others either make no sense at all or at least very weird and non-standard. So coming back to the larger issue here, Anselm's ontological argument tries to prove that God exists by saying, if your definition is great as conceivable being, then you couldn't lack for any attributes that are great. And existence is one of those. So a being that's perfectly great has to also exist and have that feature. Now here comes Moore saying, what? No, existence is not an attribute in the first place. So any claim that a perfect being has to have that attribute is wrong on its face because it's just incorrect to say that it's an attribute. Here, let me show you how it's not an attribute. Take a real predicate like something growling and attach it to a set of statements, and they all make sense. None of them make you scratch your head and say, what? I don't get that. But when we take existence and replace it with the predicate, uh, now we generate these new statements which don't really have any kind of clear interpretation or meaning. Again, I would refer you to this one, which is easy to see how strange it is. Most tigers exist. More exist. Fewer don't exist. But there's no way to count off the number of things that don't exist versus those that do. So we end up with a breakdown in meaningfulness when the predicate is used as the word exists. And he thinks that it shows us all that existence is not a predicate. If it was a predicate, then we could swap it out for another predicate and not lose meaningfulness. Take a different predicate, like happy. Uh, that would not lead to any kind of weird confusion. At least we would know what someone means. If someone says all tigers are happy, most tigers are happy. Some tigers are happy, some tigers aren't happy. There's no problem with understanding that because the contrast with happiness is not something that doesn't exist. It's something that does exist, but it's just not happy. On the other hand, when existence is being forced into the role of a predicate, the contrast with something that has that predicate is a non-existent thing, which makes no sense. So I'm trying to help you understand his point here. Let me read a little bit of his language from the book, and that will kind of bring it into greater focus, too. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Um, Similarly, most tigers growl is equivalent to the conjunction. Some tigers growl, and the number of those which don't growl is smaller than those that do. A statement which has a meaning, because there are tigers which don't growl, has a meaning. If, therefore, there are tigers which don't exist has no meaning, it will follow that most tigers exist will also have no meaning. I think, therefore, we can say that one important difference between the use of growl and some tigers growl and the use of exist and some tigers exist is that if we insert do not before growl without changing the meaning of growl, we get a sentence which, which is meaningful. Whereas if in the latter we insert do not before exist without changing the meaning of exist, we get a sentence which has no meaning whatsoever. And I think we can say this also, this also explains the fact why with the given meaning of growl, all tigers growl and most tigers growl are both meaningful. Whereas with the given meaning of exist, all tigers exist and most tigers exist are utterly meaningless. And if by the statement that growl in this usage stands for an attribute, whereas exist in this usage does not, part of what is meant is that there is this difference between them, then I should agree that exist in this usage does not stand for an attribute. Okay. So now um, one last comment on his paper here before I move to the next author. Um, he says if you really wanted to like bend over backwards to try and force these statements about existence to have some better meaning, then maybe you could say that when we speak of the non-existent tigers, we're just talking about uh, tigers that have been talked about in fiction and fantasy, like imaginary tigers. And it's true that there are at least a couple of examples of those that I could cite. So some of you guys, breakfast cereal mascots, have heard of uh, Tony the Tiger, who's the, sub, the spokes uh, mascot for Frosted Flakes. And that's a non-real, that's like a, a cartoon tiger. Uh, comic book strips or... Uh, comic strips, maybe some of you have ever heard of Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I believe it's Hobbes, or is it Calvin, but either way, it's a team of like a little boy and like his imaginary friend who's a tiger, and that's another um, non-existing tiger, perhaps. Uh, in Winnie the Pooh, uh, there's Tigger, who is, I guess, another um, non-existent tiger. So anyway, look, do we mean that when we say most tigers exist, 
that most tigers are like flesh and blood creatures out there in the wild. But then there's a small number of them that are just like made up um, cartoon characters and fictional characters from stories. Well, he says that would be at least one way of attempting to make this make a little bit better sense to assign to the role of the non-existent tiger, the imaginary tigers from stories and so on. But if that's the way that we have to strain to give some kind of interpretation that makes sense to this, it's still very, very far different from the easy way we understand ordinary predicates. If I say most tigers are happy, you don't have to think about the concept of like going into the realm of fictional objects and imaginary objects to, to parse that out. So in, in the end, existence is either not a predicate or only a predicate according to a weird interpretation that, uh, let me say it this way, either these sentences with exist make no sense at all, or they only make sense according to an interpretation that requires us to think about such far-fetched things as imaginary and fictional objects. So he rests his case. Through this analysis, he believes he's shown that existence does not function the way real predicates do. And so therefore, it's wrong and incorrect for anybody to assess that um, a perfect being must possess this feature because it's just not correctly considered to be a feature. And I'll read the last part of, that summarizes those thoughts. He says, the meaning which such an expression as some tigers don't exist sometimes has is that which is that is that which it has when it is used to mean the same as some tigers are imaginary or some tigers are not real. That some tigers are imaginary may really express a proposition, whether true or false, I don't think I can deny that. If, for instance, two different stories have been written, each of which is about a different imaginary tiger, it will follow that there are at least two imaginary tigers, and it cannot be denied that the sentence, two different tigers occur in fiction, is significant. Um, I know that at least one unicorn occurs in fiction, because there's one in Alice Through the Looking Glass, and it follows that there is at least one imaginary unicorn, and therefore, in a sense, at least one unicorn which doesn't exist. Again, if it should happen that at the present moment, two different people are each having a hallucination of a different tiger, it would follow that there are at least two different imaginary tigers that they're hallucinating. And the statement that two hallucinations are occurring makes sense. The sentence there are tigers which don't exist is therefore certainly meaningful if it means only that there are some imaginary tigers in either of the two senses that I just mentioned. But what it means is that either some real people have written stories about imaginary tigers or are having hallucinations of them or perhaps are dreaming or have dreamed of them. If nothing of this sort has happened or is happening, then there is no imaginary tame tiger. But if some tigers don't exist means all this, is it not clear that exist has not got in this sentence the same comparatively simple meaning as um, a real predicate statement would have? Okay, so closing the door for the moment on uh, the writing of G.E. Moore. And let me make one more note about his, um, his writing in the book. One thing that I eliminated from the class presentation here was one word that he involves in the statement of these sentences. For whatever reason, he writes as these tiger sentences, some, ti some tame tigers growl, most tame tigers growl, most tame tigers exist. The word tame, I find that to be confusing and unnecessary uh, to the student's comprehension. Because tame is itself a different predicate, and it doesn't add or take anything away if we just remove that from the presentation here. So in the book, when you go back and read it, if you haven't already, you'll see that he interposes the word tame in between these prefixes and the word tiger. But that is totally unnecessary, so I just wanted to streamline the content a little bit by cutting out that word tame. Okay, so here's where we're at right now, taking stock, going back to the beginning. St. Anselm, like a thousand years ago, wrote this argument that God exists, and it's been a durable argument. People continue to think about, debate, and in some cases, try to discredit and reject. Uh, the argument says that the definition of God, which is kind of universal to everybody, is greatest conceivable being. And from there, it is argued that you have to really exist in the mind in reality, otherwise you would fail to satisfy this definition. Okay, well then Gamilo says... Just having an idea of the greatest conceivable thing doesn't really prove that it's real. For example, consider the lost island, which I will just stipulate to be the idea of the greatest conceivable island. Clearly, there's no such thing in reality, despite the force of Anselm's argument. So we should have the same kind of doubts about the effectiveness of his argument trying to prove the case of God rather than the island. And then there's G.E. Moore. G.E. Moore says, my problem with the argument is more that uh, existence is not an attribute in the first place. So it's totally wrong to say that a perfect being has to possess that attribute. 
Why is it not an attribute? Well, let's show how it's not an attribute by plugging existence in to statements that had an ordinary predicate and showing how they stop making any kind of coherent sense when existence takes the place of the real predicate. That he thinks shows us sort of logically, linguistically, that um, existence is not a bona fide predicate and therefore Anselm's argument fails for that reason. Now, one more critic, and you know, if we finish with all of his material in the next 15 minutes, that's great. If not, then I will uh, pick up where we left off on Thursday. But let's talk about one more critical objection to the ontological argument. Okay, so what we have now is the writing of an even more current day philosopher. Um, he retired from Purdue University in uh, 2005. This is William Rowe, American philosopher. And um, this is from a paper that he wrote in 1993, and it's just called Why the Ontological Argument Fails. Okay, so Purdue himself was an atheist, and so um, obviously based on definition, he doesn't believe in God, and that means that he wasn't convinced by any of the different arguments that try to prove God's existence. But he has a special uh, criticism to point out for this ontological argument, and as you can see from his title, you know, bluntly stated, he just thinks the argument fails, and he's here to try and make the case why. So um, his critique of the argument the big picture of this critique is that he thinks um, just by defining something as existing, that can't prove by itself that it exists. So um, even if something exists according to the definition of, of how you define it, that doesn't itself prove that it's real in reality. That's his big picture point. And he says that as he sees it, those that advocate for the ontological argument are trying to um, use wordplay and definitions to try and establish the existence of God, but he says that doesn't work. In his view, the definition of God that Anselm and those fans of the ontological argument give is basically this. He says they define God as the existing perfect being. So God equals the existing perfect being. He says, once Anselm defines God like that, then he thinks, you know, game over. If you say he doesn't exist, you're contradicting yourself because that's like saying that the being that exists by definition doesn't exist. That's like saying the existing being that's perfect doesn't exist, and that's contradictory, so he must really exist. But here's Rose saying, hold on, though. You can't prove something exists just by stating existence in its own definition. If you could do that, then I could make up words for things that don't exist and just say that according to the definition of this word, it must exist. Okay, so um, here's the example he gives to make this point even clearer, all right? So again, we've got to consider the author's chosen example to see how he made this point. And um, he asks us to consider a set of two words that we're just going to like invent for the purposes of discussion here. So these are made up words, we're just kind of playing with language a little bit. But imagine, if you would, there's these two different types of magician, magic can and magic co. All right, so over here, magic can. Those are magicians that exist. Well, let me put it this way, existing magicians. And then the other term, invented right now, magic code. That's non-existing magicians. Now, understand that this is not a spelling error. The missing letter I here is because we're inventing this made up word, magic can, which is an existing magician, a magician that's been like a real life person. Magic co, those are the non-existing magicians from like stories and books and uh, fantasy and all of that. So with you guys' help, let's just compile like a, a short list of some members of the two categories. 
uh, magic hand on the left side of this divider, magic ko to the right. And let's try and see who knows some names of some well known real people that do magic tricks as their like profession. Um, so professional magicians, illusionists, you know, performers. So Houdini, good example, Leo. That's probably one of the most well-known household names in that realm. Houdini died during a performance of some kind of trick. But anyway, different discussion. Penn and Teller, okay, they're sort of half comedian, but they do magic tricks, so that's fine. Penn and Teller. Um, there's, the list goes on. You've got David Blaine, Chris Angel. Um, Chris Angel, Dave Blaine. Okay, and you know, certainly there's a few others too. I remember David Copperfield back in the 90s, but you know, you get the idea. People who've lived and breathed, but that did magic as their job. And then, okay, over here, I want you to give me, if you can, examples of non existent magicians. So I'm talking about like fake characters and stuff that are not real human beings, but that are the subject of stories, fiction fantasy, imagination. Like, what have been some cases like that, if you can remember, magic people from stories? Gandalf, okay, from uh, Lord of the Rings. That's a good one. Not not a real existing person. Um, Doctor Strange, okay, kind of magic, but it's all taken, it, yeah. Again, another fictional character, not a real human being. Um, Dumbledore, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the classic Merlin from the old Knights of the Round Table. That's not a real person. Harry Potter, good. Uh, so I'll just leave it with that since we could continue to go on for a while if we really wanted to. But um, what I want you to sort of think about and understand is just this division into two categories. We've got real life magicians, magic hand. We've got made up fake, you know, imaginary magicians. That's magic hope. Okay, now, um, this part of our little. Uh, lecture requires you to kind of think uh, outside the box a bit. So I want you to try and imagine this. Here in our world, all these people have, have been real people, yes. But I want you to imagine a counterfactual situation, like contrary to fact, alternative timeline of the universe, you know? You guys watch movies, so all the time you watch, like, you know, the Marvel Comics universe, and you're, like, buying into, like, here's what that universe is like. So imagine a fully blown universe, which is just like ours, with this one little difference. There's never been anybody who's taken on the profession of magician. So in this hypothetical I'm asking you to conceive of, there are no such people as Houdini, Penn and Teller, David Blaine, or anyone else. They've just never existed. Okay? Now, within that possible scenario, couldn't we have still invented up the word magic hand? Sure. It would just be like making up a word that means existing magician, but in the real circumstances there, there are no such things. Okay. Now here's what you must think about. Even if we invented the word magic hand in a scenario where there are no magicians, that would not cause there to exist magicians just by inventing and stipulating by this term that it means existing magician. If they didn't exist, then coining the phrase magic hand wouldn't like bring them into existence out of nothing. Whether they exist or not has nothing to do, in other words, with whether or not we coin this term magic hand. Or here's another possible case. Suppose that, I don't know, tomorrow in our actual world, all the magicians just spontaneously die or they pass away. So now, after that event, or they get rounded up, executed, I don't know, whatever, after that event, there's no more existing magicians at anywhere. Um, if I make up the word magic hand, would that cause these magicians to somehow reestablish in the world? No. So whether there's any existing magicians or not has nothing to do with the statement of a term which includes existence within its definition. Now, fair enough, there have been and there are people that practice magic. But again, I'm talking about a hypothetical. If there weren't any, imagine that, the word magic can would still be capable of being stated with the same definition, and it would mean existing magician even though there's no such thing. So, what he's saying is that with Anselm's argument about God, he thinks that he proves God exists just by saying, hey, look at the definition. The definition includes existence as one of those defining traits. So you can't deny that he exists because there's the definition and it says that he does. Well, what he's saying is we might be in the case right now in this world where there is actually no God 
And even though we make the word mean existing being that's perfect, there's still no such thing that corresponds to the definition. Okay? So magic hand can be similar to the word God. Both of these things are defined as existing. But whether they exist or not is a separate question from whether the word has the meaning existing so-and-so. Now, um, I think that his example is clear enough, but there's one thing about it that's a little confusing sometimes to students, and that's like, how do I envision this weird step of thinking about the counterfactual, the contrary to fact scenario in which I'm told to imagine no, ex no existing magicians, but yet nonetheless the establishment of that word. So here's a little spin on his example that I just made up that I think can kind of uh, help you understand his point even a little better. So imagine these two words, okay? Um, Unican and Unico. Okay, now, uh, based on the, the spelling, does anybody have a guess what these two words refer to? Unican, what could that be? It's, it's parallel to Magican, okay? So I'm giving you that hint. Unican, let's suppose, is a what, what? It's a unicorn, yeah, but what kind, though? Based on the way I've spelled it, I'm not spelling it unicorn. I'm deliberately spelling it in a way parallel to Magican, so the definitions are similar. It's a unicorn, but it's a... Well, no, it's not a, It's not in the singular, brand, and I, I can see the reason you might have thought that. But let's focus. Magican, what did that mean? Transpose the definition over to unicorn. Okay, good. It's existing unicorn. This is a set of all existing real unicorns. What's a unico by comparison? It's parallel to the definition of Magico. So now you'll tell me that a Unico is by definition a what unicorn? Non-existing, correct, Malia. Yes. So let's think of examples, starting over here for reasons that I would hope are going to be obvious. What are some fictional unicorns that we've all described or discussed in, in uh, I don't know, pop culture, media, fantasy, fiction, whatever? Maybe some names aren't as familiar to you because unicorns is a little more of an obscure reference, but I know of at least a couple. Maybe some of you guys have ever heard of Charlie the Unicorn. It's kind of like an internet meme. That's a, that's a non-existent unicorn, Charlie. Um, in the cartoon series My Little Pony, I believe there's some type of uh, unicorn that's a member of the you know, cast. Is it Twilight Sparkle or is it Rainbow Bright? Well, I can't remember all the names, but let's suppose that it's Twilight Sparkle, one of them. Um, there are also some unicorns that appear. Hisoka, uh, is that another one? I'll take your word for it. I'll look up the reference later. But anyway. Consider the fact that there are some unicorns which appear in stories and fiction, right? What about over here? Is there anything that can be put in this column? Is there even one name of an actual real-life unicorn that exists? Uh, I hope you'll give me a good answer. What's the answer to that question? Is there any, is there any real unicorn out there? Come on, you know the answer. <clears throat> but go ahead and tell me. No, there's no, there's no unicorns. Like, we all are clear on that, right? Unicorns aren't real. Think about it, though. This word, what does it mean? By definition, it means existing unicorn. So realize something, okay? Just because this word means existing unicorn, that doesn't prove that they're real. It just means I've created a made-up word which attaches existence to the definition of something that isn't real, okay? So, oh, yeah, Christoph Porzingis, he's the unicorn of the NBA. I've, I've heard the same thing said. Um... Jokic is another one, I think. Nikola Jokic on Denver. I mean, the guy's big, but he can shoot. Anyway, um, yeah, so there's no real unicorns, despite the invention of this word. So, coming back to the original argument of Anselm. Anselm says that, um, that God is defined as the greatest conceivable being. And Roe basically says, you're defining him as existing. And then saying, you can't deny he exists, because look, it's in the definition. But look, if that was a way of proving something exists, then I guess I just proved unicorns exist by making this word up. It means existing unicorn by definition. So to deny that there's unicorns 
is to fly in the face of the definition itself. Obviously, something can be defined as existing, but still not be real. So he says, maybe that's the case with God here. It's not really any kind of proof. You're just defining him as existing and then saying, look, that's the end of it. I've proven he exists because I've given that definition. But if something doesn't exist, then whether or not we define it as such doesn't change the situation. So unicorns don't exist, regardless of whether or not I make up a word which says existing unicorn. And so if the definition of the word God implies existence, even if it does imply that he exists, it's just a word and a definition. Whether he really exists or not depends on the facts of reality, not the coining of the phrase. So he finds fault with the ontological argument for that reason. He kind of looks at it as like a very clever piece of wordplay and definition where the person tries to uh, lead to the conclusion that God exists just by stating that he's defined as existing. Um, and I'm going to let you go now, but let me read one small passage, and you'll see what the author Rowe said. He says, um, from the fact that existing is included in the definition of magic can, it does not follow that some existing thing is a magic can. All that follows is that nothing that doesn't exist could qualify to be a magic can. If there, are no, if there were no magicians in existence, then there would be nothing to which the term magic hand would apply. This being so, it clearly does not follow merely from the definition of magic hand that some existing thing is a magician. Only if magicians exist will it be true that some existing thing is a magic hand. And so now we're in a position to help our friends see that from the mere fact that God is defined as existing, it doesn't necessarily follow that something is real that is God. Um, whether some existing thing is God will depend on whether some existing being is wholly perfect. But if no such thing exists, then the word God is like the word magican or unican, a word defined as a thing that exists, but in actual reality, no such thing. So um, that's another look at a separate objection to Anselm's argument. Um, now we're good to go for today's meeting. We'll be back on Thursday, so uh, make sure to tune in again at, at 10 a.m. on Thursday and follow the syllabus, continue going through the readings. We're going to have other arguments for God's existence to start considering on Thursday. So we'll basically be moving on from ontological argument for now and going on to some other interesting um, examples. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate your guys' attendance and all your great participation. Um, feel free to uh, hit the like button or just say bye if you wish. But either, either way, have a great day. Hope you guys are having a good first couple weeks. And if you need anything by email, let me know. Other than that, I'll see you guys in just a few days. So take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.